Strap in, my friends. We have a very special show today. Hamilton Souther from Blue Morpho Ayahuasca Center down in Peru is here, coming highly recommended by a variety of different people, most recent of which is one of my favorite recent on it hires, Mr. Jason Havey, who's hanging out over there, um, who's had his mind blown by this center and, of course, by the master medicine, the mother. Um, and so... You know, I know you've had a chance to speak with some of our good friends like Amber, but um, yeah. honored to have you here and, Thank you. and mix it up with you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Get it's a real pleasure a to be here and excited to get to share the story and, you know, keep, yeah. keep spreading the, the word around something really special in this world. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So at some point you had, you know, you had the calling. Yeah. And found you, you found yourself heading down south presumably yeah and uh so tell us a little bit of that and then we'll get right into it yeah when i was a uh, year after i graduated from college uh i started having spontaneous visions and the visions were clearly spiritual in their origin and i didn't have any explanation for them but they continued and within six weeks of the start of the visions i was told that i would go to peru and I would find this sort of prophesized apprenticeship and that I would become a Peruvian shaman, which for me sounded like, you know, know, so so, so a lot of people, a lot of people, when they have a calling, it's not quite that literal, right? (laughs) This is very literal, but I did not think this was going to come true though. You have to understand. Like I was like, ah, yeah, whatever. This isn't going to come true, but I certainly went to Peru and it did come true. And so that, that, you know, made me have to think twice about what the universe was and what life was and what was happening because I was just in my early 20s, you know, so I was just kind of starting to embark on what we'd call adult life. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess, you know, the calling comes to everybody in a different way. And I guess for you, the universe was like, this dude needs it directly literal. Literal, yeah, literal. (laughs) But I'd gotten to a point in my life where I was kind of like, where am I going? What am I doing? What is this? And I was certainly disenchanted and it got a little dark and stuff like that. So I think I needed a literal wake up call. And right. uh, I didn't have a background in spirituality or anything like that. I didn't really understand it. It didn't mean anything to me. And so, you know, when you have these light beings talking to you, you, you then decide, you know, whether you're you need help or whether they're real. You, right. you decide that, yeah, right? You gotta, you gotta make that so choice. I figured I had to give them the benefit of the doubt. So I'd go to Peru and if it you know, didn't work out, then I'd just be quote unquote normal maybe or something. Right. But, but I ended up deep in the Amazon and uh, in this tiny little river, a little community of eight families and with a, you know, a guy and a bottle of ayahuasca. And so I ended up staying for a and long then, time. <coughs> so that's, uh, I mean, that's not always the wisest way to go about searching for an ayahuasca experience is just to head there blind and, and look for a guy with the bottle definitely That's not a recommended way of going <laughs> about it in this day and age yeah you know we have sure. to think that 14 15 years ago it was climate was a little different very different very different and mm-hmm. um the number of people looking for ayahuasca was very different and those kinds of experiences and um I, it also wasn't just random i mean i had this deep spiritual connection. I had an ability to communicate with guides at that time and I was being guided by them. And I was already told the specific guide I needed to find in Iquitos. And, you know, I found by, that guy. By name or just by? By name. I had a Lonely Planet guidebook and the name was mentioned in the book. And it was every single time I went to look at the Amazon, the message was that guy, that guy, that guy, Who no one that? else. Can you share the name? Uh, it? It, was a, it was a gentleman by the name of Moises Torres, who's, you know, now kind of retired, but he mm-hmm. was the only jungle guide from Iquitos that guided into the area of the forest where I ended up apprenticing. Right. So it was very clear that I needed to find that guide because that was the only guide that took people to where Don Julio Jerena Pinedo lived, who was the sort of grand elder that trained me. Right. You know, and then it turned out that Alberto and Julio had had visions for 10 years before my arrival that I would come. So they had been seeing it for a long time, you know, that at some point this like, you know, gringo guy was going to show up and stay you know and so so it was all very part of this like very prophetic experience and it was shared on both sides and so i had to get to that location which was you know hundreds of kilometers from Iquitos, deep into the forest and so it was then there was only one guy who took you know foreigners out there so mm-hmm. you know it, so inevitably when you experience enough plant medicine it begins to reshape your paradigm and the rules by which you abide by absolutely um but you know you're talking about these things that allies were guiding you you had these visions of these light beings sure how does that how did that 
fit in your existing framework before the plant medicine and how has that been kind of sh- shaped afterwards? You know, it didn't fit at all into my previous framework. My previous framework was born into a family of Western medicine. That was the beginning and the end of it. There was, mm-hmm. uh, it was all science-based, math-based, uh, very empirically based. And there was very little room for what would be seen as entirely personal experience or personal paradigms. It's, it, was all co- it was all the collective, right? right. And so when I went down there, um, there was just a tremendous amount of doubt, confusion, you know, and I started to have to open up to a much kind of wider and broader view, which was well, maybe, you know, the other six, seven billion people on the planet who know of this stuff and have experienced this and have culture with it and collective mythology aren't wrong. You know, I kind of realized mm-hmm. I might have been really arrogant in my youth that there might be a whole lot more going on in the world than what I had initially, you know, seen and understood. And then when I got into it, um, the pendulum swung the other direction. I started to see that that was, you know, this new paradigm and this new way of thinking and this new exploration of consciousness was where the real deep wisdom was and the real knowledge was, <coughs> you know, and then over the years from there, the pendulum has kind of swung back into the middle where it it's really does now hold both, you mm-hmm. know, and, and in that journey, it, it, I think for a period of time, I was really connected to this idea of, well, kind of who had it right? Because there was this real dichotomy and this real opposition between, sure. you know, modalities. And then I started to think something very different, which has been fueling my work now, which is that it's it's not about right or wrong or about who has their finger on the pulse, but it's about consciousness. And I see that consciousness gets shaped and it really is the bridge of the entirety of our experience. And I got really fired up about how human consciousness shapes human experience and, mm-hmm. you know, what we can do to, to change the state of consciousness that we're in. Your, your journey echoes a lot of, you know, has a lot of similarities with my own. I mean, it, it first started with, you know, you get this kind of, for me, the visions didn't come before the plant medicine it came yeah. kind of after that. And when I had that direct spiritual experience and when I had the direct spiritual experience, I got really angry at the traditional paradigm that says you have to go through an intermediary in order to speak to source or sure. speak to God, you know. So I got really, you know, pissed at the at the the desert religions that said, you know, talk to your priest and the priest will relay the message and then get the message and relay it back to you. And I'm like, what the hell is that system? You yeah. know that? And so, you know, as I've gotten older, though, then you start to kind of be able to bridge you know, bridge the value of all of these different traditions and kind of see a more temperate um, kind of viewpoint. But I think one of the greatest lies still ever told in the world is that people can't go out and find these truths themselves. They have to go look in the book or they have to go talk to somebody else. Um, The truths are there for everybody. And I think that's the very heart of this medicine and shamanism in general. It's I'll show you, not tell you. Yeah, first of all, the shaman is a guide. Mm-hmm. You know, in visionary work and consciousness expansion, shamans are guides. And in traditional tribal societies, shamans are literally medicine men and medicine women, which means doctor. Yeah, you know, and so you have that you have that real split between, you know, what a doctor is in the Western world and what a doctor is in a tribal world. And this, I think, simplest difference is that in the the tribal world, the doctors never separated mysticism and spirituality and spirit and energy from the kind of whole collective knowledge base or ensemble, you know, and then you then you then see as you start to explore more and more and more these incredible commonalities, you know, these incredible commonalities in visionary experience, the wisdom and knowledge that you come into contact with, what happens to your mind as soon as you awaken the heart and the heart starts to open up and really becomes like a chalice that holds the mind and mm-hmm. gives it stability and structure. And you start to see a real difference between the institution and the institutionalization of these incredible mystical truths and understandings about life. And you can, you can be more open-minded and, and really pick from the different traditions, what aspect of it speaks to you and, and not have to fully take on the institution of it and all of the beliefs associated with that institution. And you start to see that like, you know, like you mentioned the term God. Well, from my understanding that, what that term means is an understanding found across every single religion and every single form of mysticism and every tribal society. They just have very different description for it. But the mm-hmm. concepts there, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that concept is ubiquitously expressed across the entirety of humanity. 
Right, and just it's just the connotation that freaks people out because sure. it's been associated with so many different things depending upon the context from which it's been used. Yeah, you know, I, that's why you have to be careful with vocabulary because you say God to some. Oh, you say it means God something to totally me, different. You say God to me at 22, and I'm like, you know, go fuck yourself. <laughs> or, you know, I, I mean, I was angry at yeah, that, sure. at that kind of paradigm. Whereas, sure. whereas now the the vocabulary, as you said, doesn't bother me because my understanding. It extends far beyond what any. I'm. I'm not in that context anymore. Yeah, you know, and I'm you can. Able to apply you can, in my own context. Yeah, and you can leave the context. And you know, when I see the great criticisms about uh, the large spiritual or religious institutions, what is being criticized is the institution. Totally. And the practitioners in the institution. That's what seems to get criticized. And and the the other side of it is the push to try to make that institution strong. And what seems to be left out is the real mysticism within every single <coughs> tradition. And, yeah, and it's the real, there. The real it, it really truth. is there. Yeah. Like, you know, people can, can say whatever they want about uh, any of the, the religions. But in all of the religions, there's a paradigm associated to what we would think of as duality or a dualistic construct where there are opposing forces or opposing pieces. And mm -hmm. you start to look at it, whether it's, you know, angels and demons or it's yin yang or it's light dark or it's mm -hmm. all Tao and flow. You know, you start to see the commonalities. And what I would like to see, you know, for people who are who are really curious and they're exploring and they would like to find these truths out for themselves is to to step away from the antagonism about all of it and really just get open yeah you know get really open and get really flexible and say okay i don't need to fight you over words and i don't need to fight you over meaning we're exploring mm -hmm. you know and that was i think one of the the benchmarks for me going down to peru is that it allowed me to be an explorer mm -hmm. you know the whole world's been like the world has been you know, traced with human feet now, footsteps everywhere, but the inner worlds of consciousness are entirely personal and, and they're open for exploration for each individual. And, you know, you can't, I, yeah. you can't touch it unless you taste it and explore it yourself. I think that is the most important message of, of all of this is don't take anybody's word for it. Go out there and find it. Please. And, that, and that's why you see these shamans smiling over and over again, because they know what you're going to find oh, for sure. the most part. Sure, sure. You know, like they know where it's heading, but they still won't tell you because they know if they told you it wouldn't matter anyways. It's you're just gonna you got to see it. Yeah, you know, it's you thoughts and feel ideas. It. It's all thoughts and ideas and it becomes theory and then it becomes another group of opinions that everybody can debate. Yeah. You know, but until you really get in there and you start to explore for yourself what any of these concepts mean and what any of these visionary experiences mean, it's just conjecture. And one of the things I loved about shamanism more than anything was that there was never an expectation to believe. There was only an expectation to experience. Mm -hmm. So once I started to yep. apprentice and was accepted to apprentice, I didn't have the option to back out anymore. I didn't yeah. get like take the night off. You know, it was yeah. like you're serious, but but let's find out what you're serious about, not tell you what you have to be serious about. Yeah. You know, and it takes it out of the realm of just I believe this because I'm supposed to. I mean, when I talk about what happens after you die, I can speak about it with certainty. And sometimes people challenge me, "How are you sure, bro? You know, you're not dead." And I was like, "Look, I'm personally sure. I'm not going to be able to ever convince you." to be personally sure, but I've seen what that dimension feels like. I've looked at it, I've sure. felt it, I know it's there, and I'm 100% confident personally that that, you know, that other dimension exists across the threshold of the transition. But if I hadn't been there and felt it and seen it, you know, I wouldn't, I would never have that kind of Absolutely, confidence. you know, and when I look at that kind of a, a concept and we talk about something that is, you know, so intense as death, you know, the very first thing I always think of is, wouldn't that be entirely personal? <laughs> How is, I mean, it's going to speak to you. It's not speaking yeah. to anybody else, right? right? Everybody at the funeral is alive except for the one guy who's dead. So, so that experience has to be entirely personal. And then, and then we don't even know what parts die other than just the body. We know the body goes into stillness and then, mm -hmm. you know, decomposes as it was constructed. But... But the experience beyond that, and that's where I always go back to consciousness, shows us the, the infinite, it shows us the eternal, time's different. Mm -hmm. It shows us the emotional, completely different. Mm -hmm. Shows us the connected, completely different. Shows us the multidimensional, completely different. You know, and so, so 
for those of people like you who've had that experience, you can speak with certainty on it because you've crossed the rainbow bridge, you've crossed the bridge of consciousness, you've yeah. gone to the non-physicality of consciousness, you've experienced the eternal of consciousness, mm -hmm. and the, the awareness that you don't lose identity, but you lose identification along the way. Like, Beautifully said. You're still you. I mean, right. it's like completely. Just the best fucking version of you. The best of version of it. It's the yeah. cleanest, like, you know, most truthful, most loving, most aware, most open, and most so, incredible. And so happy, you know. And, and that's another thing. I've had other experiences with other really powerful plant medicines, one of which was a boga with a, a 10th generation Bwiti shaman and really went deep in that, where I was able to speak to this, the consciousness, the essence of consciousness of people both alive and dead. Sure. And that's an interesting part of the paradigm. Sure. But the interesting thing to me about that is you, you think of ghosts, like we have this Western conception of ghosts and it's ooh, and it's all like that. <laughs> These people were cracking jokes that we were laughing. It was like the very best iteration of their personality and identity. And when we were done talking, they would screw around with me. They, some of them would flip me <laughs> off like, hey, 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 stop talking to me. We're done here. You know, and, and to see the like the the vibrancy of those of that spark of consciousness and the joy and yeah. the love that was emanating was really something that was that was special and will always kind of stick with me yeah well, when the human body is the the core rooted location of consciousness there's all of the separation between everybody that mm -hmm. can that is perceived but not real right it's perceived yeah. but it's not real like right. between you and me right now air is connecting us tables connecting us floors connecting us chair matter concept auric fields there's all these things connecting us but it seems so separate as soon as you can shed that that concept of separation you're instantly awakened to a greater understanding and a greater connectivity with everything around us yeah. you know and that that's what the shamans really explore right they're just looking at how everything's connected and what it all means and you know what you can do with it and how you can help people with it and what kind of medicine you can practice and sure. how you can expand consciousness and then once you understand that we're all like cells in a single organism you know and that's when you can really when you when you make that clear then you realize what your true agenda is it's okay yeah you got to keep your own cell healthy you know because yeah. you're part of the organism you got to keep the cells you directly touch maybe your family these close friends but for those of us who have the ability to communicate to a larger part of the body and make that healthy, you know, of course we got to do that. And we're all part of this same, the same organism, just, you yeah. know, separated, as you say, by, you know, our own constructs in our mind. Yeah, I think if humanity could collectively understand that the trajectory and transit of life in time is very, very short, even though it seems when you're in it very long, like... 60, 70, 80 years seems long. And when you're a kid, I mean, an hour can seem like forever. Yeah. But if you look at sort of, you know, whenever we want to call the origin point of time until now, there's a ton of it out in the universe, mm -hmm. like this huge amount of time. And that as an expression of consciousness, that eternal notion of our being really just got started in this life. And as soon as we shed the rest of it, and I don't mean it in, in the form of having to physically die, but shed these, these like perception barriers between all of us, we can start to see that that very same consciousness that we're talking about that you find in plant medicines is happening in the normalcy of our daily life. We're just sure. cut off from it. Sure. You know, and then we can get to start, start to get to like that, that really amazing paradigm that life can be on a, a global level or a humanity based level where people are actually seeing that we are one humanity. Mm -hmm. They can see beyond the differences, beyond the cultures, beyond the races and see like, yeah, we're all experiencing the exact same core architecture of life. Like conception birthed us into cells, cells birthed us into little bodies. And we've been cruising the earth ever since trying yeah. to figure it out, you know? <laughs> and like, like it, that aspect of it alone right there really to me is a, a deep, humbling experience to understand that there is a one single collective story we're all figuring out together mm -hmm. yeah it's like uh collectively we form that one the one source you know that create that life force that creation and, and when i look about sometimes you wonder like well what's the purpose of working so hard to improve consciousness well it's like the more collectively we form that the mood of god you know like is god happy or is god frustrated and pissed <laughs> off and sad you know sure. like collectively if we all elevate then the whole mood of the of the collective improves and so it's like that the organism is happier healthier 
stronger and absolutely absolutely i look at humanity as a single collective and i look at it as a single ancestry and a single timeline mm -hmm. and i don't really know i mean i studied anthropology so 150 160 thousand years ago we have archaeological record of the first homo sapiens sapiens sort of mm -hmm. walking the earth and stuff and i see this continuous timeline ever since then and that what really separated homo sapiens sapiens from all of the other kinds of organic life is on earth was that we had this awakening to consciousness we have an understanding of our own consciousness a self-identified version of the consciousness a collective version of the consciousness and so what we're really talking about is the nexus of the mind and the imagination and the emotions and physicality to actually do something to affect consciously and know it and so to me, the whole game now is consciousness. Yeah, We've played out you. the physical game, you know, ad infinitum, technological revolutions, you know, to this, this incredible explosion of digital revolution, information, technology everywhere. And so it's like, well, now what? Now what do we do? And it's like, well, the evolution of consciousness and the work to evolve consciousness becomes truly the next human operating system. It, it can redefine physics. It can redefine technology. It can redefine health and wellness. It can redefine, you know, what you guys are into with total human optimization. It can redefine the, what a mind is and what a brain is. And I don't see any reason why we don't understand that we're on the cusp of that next evolution. Like, this is, this is the moment in human history. To mm -hmm. me, it's the most exciting time in human history ever. Yeah, I agree. I think we're very close to starting to actually build those physical bridges to these consciousness and other concepts. You know, already, like, the science about the power of belief is coming out. Sure. You know? So you're, you're having books, like, by Joe Dispenza and these different books, You Are the Placebo, talking about these amazing stories about the placebo and the nocebo effect, how the mind alone can affect can cure an incurable disease or actually create an incurable disease, sure. you know, and, and just documented cases of this. So we're starting to find these connections where thoughts, you know, interpret to matter. But then it starts to get even more interesting in the quantum physics level where the observation of a certain thing will create the outcome of a certain thing, you know, the observer effect in quantum physics. Absolutely. And then I think we're even on the cusp of finding out even more links. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been really interested in the results of that particle accelerator that they've uh, that they've had going in Europe, and yeah. they're looking for what they call the God particle, that sure. Higgs boson particle. And so, a lot of people were thinking that the Higgs boson was going to come in at a weight of 115 units, and that was like the conventional theory, right? And they didn't even know if it existed, but if it did, that made everything make sense. And some some other factions thought it would come in at 140, which meant it was a multiverse. And so they actually ran the thing, and nobody, had, nobody thought it was going to be anything in between. They ran the thing, and it came out as an average between the two. <laughs> and I was like, that's very curious. Sure. It just makes me wonder if that particle isn't some direct link, like that nexus point where belief translates into matter. And so the collective belief of what it is, it's like, oh, what does everybody believe it is? Oh, 126, cool. I'm good with that. Yeah. You know? Like, I think we're on the cusp of, and that's kind of like a radical theory that would be rejected by every quantum physicist now. But at some point, I think we'll actually start to find the science to blend with this spirituality because as above, so below. I mean, these rules are, are going to have their footprints in the physical world just as they are in the spiritual world. Yeah, the work that we're doing right now with the Blue Morpho Foundation and sort of our expansion into the, the modern world, because, you know, I lived in the Amazon for... 12 years straight just practicing traditional Amazonian ayahuasca shamanism is to take the mystical knowledge that we've amassed and actually apply science to it and apply math to it. And mm -hmm. we're in the process right now of creating a coalition of astrophysicists and particle physicists to be able to start to mathematically model the mysticism and Beautiful. bring mystical understanding into hard science. Yeah, because it's, I mean, the connection will be there, and that, that I agree with you, that's going to be the real revolution. Just as the clinical studies that have been done on psilocybin and MDMA have allowed those medicines, and um, marijuana, the medical kind of research that has come out, mm -hmm. have allowed those to become accepted by mainstream society and start to become, start to proliferate. Yeah. I mean, the train is on the tracks for legalization of these things because of the scientific method, which has been our predominant religion in our culture. I mean, that is the religion oh, that everybody yeah, ascribes Western to. Science, so we've applied this, these so-called mystical and these drugs, you know, these psychedelic drugs to that, and all of a sudden people are 
accepting it. Oh, yeah, mushrooms. I heard that's really good for end-of-life care. Oh, yeah, there's that study by Johns Hopkins. And oh, yeah, MDMA. Yeah, it's great for PTSD. And then all of a sudden, people's minds start to open. And I think when we start to make the connections like you're working on making, where it starts to tie into more of these more of these phenomena, it's just going to really open up people's minds to a truth that has been, you know, forgotten by most people. Yeah, I think the the sacred plants are so important in that because, you know, through the work that we've done at Blue Morpho, we've had people from 60, 70, 80 countries from around the world come and 48 of the 50 states have come to our center from every single background and walk of life. And so we've had these like, you know, MDs and PhD doctors coming to us over and over and over again, looking to extend not only their own understanding of the universe, but their own work. And all of a sudden we have this like watering hole, this meeting point somewhere in the world around this understanding of exploring consciousness in conjunction with these plants. And it's bringing together people that never would have sat Mm -hmm. around a table together. And this, and in this case, it's not even a table. It starts in like a a great circle in a very ancient traditional way where everybody's dropping these, you know, cloaks of sort of modernity and saying, okay, I'm here, I'm present. You know, I'm a big bundle of energy. Where is this going <laughs> to take us all? And then the next days, the conversation gets to become something that really more is coalition based and, you know, sharing ideas and crossing these gaps that you would never see, you know, in other places. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You, you talk about sitting around in a circle and, <clears throat> you know, we had never spoken before this podcast. And, you know, we find that we're sharing so many similar ideas. But you find that in almost every ayahuasca circle you have unless someone's really trying to put on a show or something and there's a rare circumstance where you'll find that where they they want to have an experience that will impress people or something like that i've seen that occasionally but for the most part if people are telling the truth i've never had anybody go around with the talking stick or however you do it and describe (laughs) their experience and be like what (laughs) no that doesn't make any sense it's like you everybody comes to truths that inherently sit as you know, sit well as in, and in, in congruent with the same paradigm. It's, it's a wild phenomenon, whereas no matter who they are, no matter what background they come from, when they share their experience, you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think with, in that case, what we're getting is a group of people to sit down and agree to some core similarities to life. Right. And when I look at modern society and the modern lives we live, I see that most modern people were born into incredible stability in those core sort of vectors. And so you have, you know, relative physical health and well-being. Like I always say to people who are fairly sick, focus on the 80, 90 percent of you that's really healthy because it's that's where we're going to find that movement. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the mind, same thing with the emotion, same thing with the imagination. And when you come to something like ayahuasca and those kinds of experiences, you already know you're going to those places. You're going to your understanding within you of these core aspects of just what it is to be a human being. And modern societies like floats above that. They just take all of that for granted and then live within a psychic state where you don't have to really worry about those concepts. You're not really worried about your physical survival. You're not really worried about how you're going to come out of one day to the next mentally or emotionally, or you're not, you know, typically in that moment coming to this point where, you know, in four or five hours, you're looking to do 10, 20 years of psychological processing, you know? And so when you know you're coming to that, it makes everybody, well, not everybody, but almost everybody like get really real, like really deep inside themselves and just say like, here we are. And at Blue Morph, I used to love watching that the first day everybody was pantomiming like their own existence. Right. Like literally acting it out. Right. Like nerves were up, <laughs> anxious, like they're literally in their physical expressions, you know, like acting out what's going on. And by day three, they would just be like so relaxed in the chair, <laughs> talking, sharing, expressing. And that whole mask of personality and sort of layer upon layer upon layer of this this psychological competitiveness for the space and you know who's going to have the greatest experience and competition all that was neutralized to a point where everybody's just really really in their skin yeah you know grounded present saying like yeah i i had a big experience last uh, night yeah. like that really rocked my world you know i don't even know how i'm going to in- integrate it you know or sure you know after that and I thought that's something very special. It is very special. And what's also special is that there's people who inherently, I've seen it in many different groups, 
inherently completely dislike each other upon initial meeting. You know, it's like, I can't fucking stand that guy. He right. like, drives me crazy. And, you know, there's people like that out in the world. It's like a microcosm for the world. But you go through ceremony like this and you share this sacrament. And all of a sudden, by the end, you know, the hugs between every single person are real. You know, whatever, whatever differences, yeah, they may still not be the person you invite over for Thanksgiving. But nonetheless, there's a mutual respect and a kind of, it's just a whole different vibe that, that comes from that. And it just makes me think that out to the, our society as a whole, we're missing ceremony from our life in general. We're missing that ability to bond with people over something as important as this. It, does, it wouldn't necessarily have to be plant medicine. But sure. the, the importance of ceremony to kind of bridge these gaps and break down these judgments and barriers that we have is so important. And plant medicines are definitely one of the best ways to do that. Yeah, ceremony is something certainly missing in modern society. I think it didn't have a lot of space in Western scientific thought, like you mentioned, sort of the proliferation of the concepts of Western science. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you look at just the way people treat the idea of ceremony and how difficult it is, like planning a wedding or something, like what people think of as their most like most important day of their yeah. life. And you know, you got Bridezilla shows on TV and stuff. <laughs> like you can't you can't just have a ceremony, right? Like yeah. like what is that aspect of the expression of human consciousness and a kind of human gathering to have it not be weird, to have it just be completely normal. Like is, for me at first, it was a little bit weird. I would sit with this tremendous anxiety before quote unquote ceremony out in the jungle and stuff. And you hear the cacophony of all the sounds and the animals and the jungle comes to life. And you're sitting there going like, okay, like, like the engines are revving for the Indy 500. Right, like it's right. going to happen. And then it, it started after years to become really relaxed. And it's like, well, we, all we're doing is ceremony. Yeah. Like it, like we're always in ceremony. You know, I do probably, I don't know, four or five ceremonies a week of different kinds just to be in that state of consciousness and to keep that continuity and flow of openness and, and the, the expression of our energy and sort of that, that vitality that we get from that experience. And I think that, you know, the message is ceremony is natural. Mm. It's natural. Yep. It's natural to revere life. We revere life. Yeah, and the ones, unfortunately, you, you touched on, I mean, the ones that we do have have become increasingly hollow, really, of actual genuine meaning. I mean, think about the most important two, weddings and funerals, really. Yeah. You know, and so uh, every, everyone, you know, bridal shower, or bar mitzvah, or what it, put anything, birthday, any anything like that. And it's really about gifts, to show, drinking, you know, it's about things that really are have absolutely nothing to do with real ceremony, you know, for the most part. I mean, there's some tender moments that can happen in a wedding, but it's not really designed to, to magnify that necessarily. It's just kind of like it happens because the union is special, if it is special. Otherwise, it's just like, man, what the hell is this? Yeah, but, you know, look at the paradigm that we have in Western society where in like this incredible developed, incredibly wealth, incredible expression of technology, we've also been taught you will never be real. Like never be real. Never just show up and be yourself. Do mm. not do that. If you mm. do that, you are gonna get kicked, spit on, bullied, hurt, worked. Like no one, no one is supposed to just be themselves. There's no space for an individual to just be who they are in like this collective fear-based mindset. And so how are we supposed to come and just relax and be together as people and have enough space around us and enough respect around us to let everybody be themselves and see that there's no reason for all of those fears? Yeah. You know, if, if we can't get past that, how are we going to be able to have ceremony? Because everybody's going to be peacocking and primping and sitting <laughs> and adjusting and, and like, you know, faking the facial expressions and communicating smoke screen the whole time. Sure. And again, going back to the sacred plant medicine, they tear that down. Yeah. Like just tear it down, yep. you know, instantly, like instantly. Yeah, you're going to be shitting in front of people. You're going to be puking in front of people. Eventually, you don't give a shit what you're wearing. No. You know, all of these things all that you formerly things. thought are just like, they're gone. Yeah, because there ya. is this commonality, and that's where we find ceremony. And so that's something that we can be mindful of and conscious of and continue to share and support other people getting into. And I've been really working with that because ceremony is so important to our lives. 
and it's so common, you know, in the cultures where I, I learned all of these, these different techniques and, and methodologies to explore consciousness. And then coming back here, confronting that, that sort of vibe around ceremony and weirdness around ceremony and like people not really sure how to be. And so I've really started to exploring just playing games as ceremony. <laughs> Yeah. Like different kinds of conscious exploration games because we're used to playing games and it's something fun Mon that we monkeys do. Monkeys like games. We love games, <laughs> right? We love pickup sticks, jacks, yeah. cards, <laughs> whatever. Like whatever, whatever. Yeah. And so if we could have games that really opened consciousness and really helped us get comfortable with each other, it could be a great way to be able to, you know, introduce again the concept of ceremony to I, the West. I think that's really important. And even gamifying, there's this new app and technology it's called the muse and it's a portable eeg device that you put on your head that measures your brain waves nice and then it's hooked to an app that gives you biofeedback to when you're in a calm meditative state so you focus on your breathing and you count your breaths or whatever your practice is and then so when you're calm you know by reading the brain waves the day at the screen gets calm and it's a sunny day and there's birds will start chirping if you do well. And if you're really, really calm, a bird will land on you and it'll sound like you got headphones in. And then when you get distracted, you know, the, the storms will blow in and wind will go. But the whole time, at the end of the day, you get a, a reading of how much time you spent calm, how much time. So you get a point score and how many birds and whatever. And I think this has incredible potential because incredible it gamified potential. you know, meditation. Sure. Not only is it giving biofeedback, which is really important, but yeah. you're getting points. So it's this addicting thing like, ooh, man. As they brought it out at this place called Summit Series, which is a bunch of entrepreneurs. And it was funny because yeah. everybody was going around and everybody was trying to out-meditate each other. <laughs> And I was like, what was your score? How many birds you get, bro? <laughs> you know, and even me, like, I knew how silly it was, but I, I had a good session, and I yeah. couldn't help but being a little bit like, oh, yeah, uh, one bird, huh? Okay, cool, I got four. <laughs> you know, like, and I would try and stop, like, stop that, Aubrey, that's silly, that's crazy, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, you, you can't be proud about meditating this person. But we're so wired to this competition and game that, yeah. that instead of just completely denying that, but helping people with, like, a little foot in the door, and saying, hey, let's have some fun with it. I think it's a smart way to do it. Yeah, I think having fun with it's key. Um, if it's not fun, we're not going to do it very long. Right. We, we already do enough things in our life that's not fun. Yeah. Right? Like, how many people really like their jobs? Like, really, like, oh, man, that's fun. Like, oh, it's so fun every day. <laughs> oh, fun. Oh, people hear that. it on it, Hamilton. Oh, my, that is something very true. Uh -huh. I walked around your facility, and I have to say, the overall mood and vibe here is pretty special. I might hit you up for a job after this. <laughs> I might, I might be like, hey, you know, I think I want to stay in Austin. Maybe and, I can and, go to Peru and you can take my job for a while. I'm pretty sure you got we this. We can get on Oprah and do a role reversal <laughs> thing, right? Yeah, we can do the switch. <laughs> we'll do this, the switcheroo and see yeah. how it all goes. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. We'll just swap around. We'll be like, you know, how like Dr. Manhattan had other avatars sure. you could work with to like work on different stuff. That would actually be really fun because we could see how after all of this training, how the psyche stacks up to like 120 ceremonies, you know, of <laughs> yeah. Aya in a year. Yeah. And see how, <laughs> see how it holds. Beautiful. Yeah, we've watched people, you know, when they come to train, and, and this is also for the people, I get so many, you know, emails and stuff and Facebooks and things like that about people asking about apprenticeship. Like, if you really want to learn, you got to get ready to have your head be in this game because mm -hmm. it's 100, 120 ceremonies of, you know, really hardcore mind bending experiences in a year, year after year after year after year after year. Yeah, I drank ayahuasca for over 10 yeah, I'm years. Out. I'm out. I, retract, I retract my desire right? to switch with you. Right? Like, we you can keep we, that. That's good. We, do, we do that. <laughs> like, you know how you have, like, out there the board with everybody's stats on it, right? Yeah. Like, like, like that's kind of how it gets, you know? You're like, oh, yeah, another 100 ceremonies, another 100 ceremonies, another 100 ceremonies. And so it would be fun to see how we could, uh, we could see how we, how we oh. withstand that environment, <laughs> right? For sure. Yeah. For sure. I mean, that's, <clears throat> it's, it's a way to kind of temper the steel you know to a certain degree Absolutely. it's tempering the steel of the psyche it's putting the sword in folding it hammering it yeah and a lot of swords would break in that kind of heat um but yeah. and so generally the idea of what i'm what you do at your center and what the you know what the good centers do is they give you just enough heat so that the sword doesn't just shatter enough. you know just but enough. enough that it'll allow you time to refold and get stronger and, and then come back and and integrate, you know, sure. get that time to, and then another turn back in the fire, you know, to get stronger, to get sharper and to be more prepared for your life. Yeah. 24 hours later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At yeah. our center, we, you know, in a week we'll do five ceremonies mm -hmm. and that's a lot. Yeah. That's absolutely a lot. Um, but you know, I've been working, I, I studied in the traditions 
and with two two incredible master shamans that had you know long lineages and all this this you know what I consider to be like really blessed experiences and then I kept looking at ayahuasca and seeing that that there's this issue of volatility and, and safety and concern around that and then in my own explorations of consciousness I started to look at universal expressions and I developed this methodology called the blue morpho way that sets the space for ayahuasca all in nine universal definitions of human consciousness and when I first took it there about five six months ago to, I de developed it outside of ayahuasca with the work that I was doing in the states I wanted to see if ayahuasca would destroy it or if ayahuasca would support it so you set up kind of like a codification a paradigm of sorts that you want yeah i've to codified test. human consciousness uh -huh. in nine universal definitions okay uh they apply to every single human being at every single moment of life once all of the pieces come online so mm -hmm. from embryonic stages until sort of what we would consider to be full human capacity once the the once that's formed i i you know i within mystical terms codified it. What I want to do now is turn it into mathematical forms. Mm -hmm. But what it did to ayahuasca was something that I, I, I couldn't even believe the, the results. The ayahuasca completely overlaid to the structure. Mm -hmm. So we set it up in, inside the ceremony. And um, I mean, for those who are like real mystic nerds out there, like, like I am, uh, it's, it's called the medicine world. And it starts if you model the universe in numbers of pieces. So it's like, what does the universe look like at one? What does the universe look like at two pieces? What does the universe look like when there's three pieces? What does it look like when there's four pieces? And um, it changed ayahuasca. And I'd never seen anything touch ayahuasca. I mean, shamans, when they're in really, really in ceremony, and you have a big group, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of purging, 50, 60, 70% of your energy is just going to keep in the room contained. Mm -hmm. You know? And all of a sudden, the whole space of ayahuasca completely relaxed. Like ayahuasca relaxed, it was incredible. It was in so you're actually setting up some kind of code of some kind of diagram on the ground or no no it's it's uh you know the ayahuasca shamans get very very good at holding abstract uh, consciousness concepts as right. normal real states but I mean I have written it out on you know paper mm -hmm. and we've so drawn hold, it you're and everything. holding this energetically but we hold it energetically and we hold it you together psychically with, we, share with with the, mm -hmm. we share it with the group. We share it with the group and then we hold it within our own consciousness and it, uh, it awakens a universal state of human consciousness which doesn't then have to be held. All the comparative states dance in light inside your brain and so you have to dance with them and you move, you learn in ayahuasca to move really quickly, right. you know, to be able to keep it all together and there's, because it's such a vast amount of information, right? And um, this made it all incredibly still and calm and it allowed the transformation inside ayahuasca to be accelerated so you know mm -hmm. before you're like okay uh you know it's a common sort of thing people have said like 10 years of you know counseling in one night of ayahuasca like right. that now it can be like 20 30 40 years so it's a like magnifier magnifier sure. accelerator of it but through a, a kind of stability and contained expression within the ceremony itself which allowed for a much greater expression of the movement of consciousness. Well, it makes sense. I mean, if you're thinking of ayahuasca as an energy source and that energy is splaying out in all different directions, you know, like a, like a bad connection in your, in your light socket, you know, where it's sparks are fizzling out and you're this master electrician, like, ah, get, get, come on, we gotta get, right. you know, get this through there. And you, then you find the right, you know, the right converter there that can just take that energy at that voltage without frying the system and then apply it so that it really transmutes the transformation. I mean, it makes sense theoretically, absolutely. We gotta go experience it. <laughs> I'm in. We have to, we have to go experience this. And so, you know, this just happened in the last year and for me it was revolutionary. I mean, mm -hmm. the super revolutionary to something like the practice of ayahuasca because there had always been this, what I call inside outside concerns, like bad stuff coming in, what do you do with the stuff getting purged, all of that. And the system allowed us a way to work that just neutralized all of those concerns so that the experience can have, you know, naturally much less fear, much less anxiety, much less concern and can be, safer and also you know more effective at healing yeah that's interesting you mentioned that because that's one of the issues that i have with a lot of ayahuasca shamanism is the obsessive concern of oh this person's throwing darts and there's this force and i mean I, and it can get to this point where it's like a video game almost. it is like it can play itself out very much like 
you yeah. know, only where the, your collateral in the game is your skin. Right. And yeah. then that never really sat that well with me is like, you know, for whatever reason, I knew that there was a better way. You know, I didn't fully ever buy into it completely, although I understand the, the true importance of a sacred space and yeah. having it contained. But it would just get to these proportions where it'd be like, OK, come on now, guys, you know, let's. This is strong medicine. Let's sit in. Let's be in a safe, contained space, and let's l allow the medicine to do its work. Yeah. Don't be so scared of everything coming in. And I think so many people, when they're in that paradigm, they have so much fear because they yeah. think something. Oh, this thought that they have, which they just need to purge naturally and relax. They think it's some demon or something that's yeah. attacked them. And and so I think I really like the way that you're describing. Is like, look, let's set this. You know, set this in motion and, yeah, and then be done with that. Be, whole done with it. be done with that whole side. Yeah. You know, that was a real perplexing question to me early on because I came from California and, you know, occult practices, not like on the open radar. You're not hearing about people doing spells and weird things like that all the time. You get down to the Amazon and it's like, hello, this is this is the part of the culture. You know, right. and then I, so I started to look at it really kind of from an anthropological background of like, well, why does this exist? And then I got deep into the, the tribal societies. And this is also, you know, not a warning to people, but, but a, a disclaimer, like think about the cultures and what the cultures believe in and what the cultural paradigms are of the people that you go take, you know, visionary medicines with, mm -hmm. because it's where they're coming from, mm -hmm. right? It's where they're coming from. And the tribal societies that developed ayahuasca practices, and I pay a lot of respect and homage to the ancient traditions, they also didn't understand pathogen pathogenic illness. They only thought of psychomagical or mystical illnesses. There is yep. uh, deep competition in, within the tribes. <coughs> they were, they were war-based tribes, headhunting tribes, and they developed these you know, traditions also with the medicine. So there's a lot of coloring of that, of those sure. belief systems into you know, the traditional ayahuasca practices. Um, and, they're not reflective. And, pow and power itself. Absolutely. You know, the, the medicine men were some of, if not the most, some of the most powerful people in that tribe. Absolutely. So, and and they power either, is a force. Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And they were. I mean, they were either the doctors of the tribe. They were the, the tribal leaders or they're the ones who are giving, you know, advice to the tribal leaders. So mm -hmm. right there, you can already see the balance of power. Taking all of that into consideration, you know, our safety is important, but we need to understand, you know, that we don't need to go down to the Amazon and get caught up in all of that. Yeah. Right. That's not why we're there. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I see a lot of people get caught up in all that. I used to be, you know, very cautious with people. I tell them, like, be really careful because you don't really know where these people are coming from or, you right. know, they're not coming for the same reasons. Like when I first lived in the Amazon out where I lived, there were na like full blooded natives where Spanish was a second language to them. Catch and there were also mestizo shamans. And um, they were the Matzas cat people. They were really interesting people, mm -hmm. really interesting people. It's really interesting to know a group of people that do not share the same common law structure as you, like inside you. When you just sit across the table and look at them, you know they are not being controlled <laughs> by any of the same concepts of law. They're not thinking that way. Yeah, right? a little. You get, your energy, yeah, yeah, no, you're like a little. Woo. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I remember the, I mean, this is an aside, but it's a story worth telling. I remember when the Peruvian guys, you know, and these are like frontiersmen. Right. They're telling me, be careful with those guys. <laughs> right. The frontiersmen guys are like, and I'm already like being careful with the frontiersmen guys. Yeah, right? Right, right. They're the ones going, hey, be careful with those guys. Those guys aren't like us. You know, we're like, we're like, chill. <laughs> those, those are those guys. Right. Uh -huh. um, you know, and so I just think that, that let's not be scared about all of this stuff. Let's not be concerned about these, these questions, but let's also be smart about how we're gonna, gonna you know, think about using this visionary medicine. And there's all this stuff out there about, do you need a shaman? Do you not, not need a shaman? Is there danger? Is there not danger? Is there all of these concerns or not? Let's get really focused on why we're there. We're right. there for medicine. Right. It's the only reason why we're there. Medicine is used to, to learn and also heal. Mm -hmm. So you learn from the medicine and you, you also heal with the medicine. And so that's why we're there. And, you know, after dealing with all that stuff for a long time, I wanted, I wanted a solution. And so I developed my own solution. I didn't want to deal with, you know, angry people all over the world being competitive in psychomagical ways or even physical ways. Like, sure. you know, I yeah, kind of no. realized that, that there's a lot more efficiency and peace. 
just a lot more efficient. <laughs> totally. And, right. and, and instilling a strong sense of self-reliance, you know, I mean, some, if you get so caught up in these outside forces, that was, you know, I gained a lot from working with Alberto Violda's group when I went down there initially. Um, but, you know, a criticism I had of, of his school of practice and, you know, he does great things, all respect to him for doing what he started. But he has a belief in, and you can read about it in his book, Shaman Healer Sage. He has a belief system where these energies get stuck in you and you need somebody else to extract them for you. Right. Yeah. So constantly when I was down there with his group, they were in constant need of help. I mean, we'd be in ayahuasca ceremony and it'd be like like popcorn popping up like ah help me meister 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 help me help me because in their mind they had instilled the belief system that things get stuck that they can't remove themselves that they need somebody else to extract and, you know and just that belief system it it shook their own self-reliance and their ability to really transform with the medicine you know because their belief system made that in effect true oh, whereas absolutely. if they rewound that belief system and said no, you know, I'm going to be fine. I'm a being made of light. I'm a being made of light, made of diamonds. What's going to hurt me? You know, I'm right. invincible. I'm in the house of my father's source. You know, I'm an invincible being in existence for a blink of a time. What's going to hurt me? You have that attitude in there. And nothing's then you gonna allow stick. nothing's <laughs> going to stick. <laughs> so you're a Teflon. Yeah, exactly. You're and, like and so, Teflon <laughs> exactly. <in laughs> and that's what's so important. And even I've seen this yeah. over and over again. Like people will get afraid of these other external forces where I know yeah. that you know, look at yourself as this being of light that's invincible and you are, you are that thing and you can go through these things Absolutely. that way. And I think it's important to, you know, to not get caught up in that other paradigm where you just, you're giving away your own protection and self-reliance. Yeah. I mean, what we do at our center now and uh, part of the Blue Morpho way and our medicine world work is to understand that the universe as a whole represents all of it, like literally all of it, all of it at once, not differentiated. And that undifferentiated point we call love. We call mm -hmm. it like this sublime grace that is, you know, completely supportive and completely guiding. And then we say, check out your body. Your body's made up of it. And then check out your mind. Your mind's made up of it. And then right. check out your feelings. Your feelings are made up of it. And check out your imagination. Your imagination's made up of it. So sure, we can encounter all of these different kinds of beings and all of these different mind forms and projections and, you know, it, incredible dimensions and you know honeycombing universes and filled just teeming with life and spirit and all this stuff and always remember that when you're there if you need to release something if you need to purge something you need to let something go remember the love right there and just hand it over right there don't yeah. try and find it somewhere else if you find it in your knee that's where the healing medicine and love already is so just connect the two and then it's gone and yeah you know we teach people how to do that themselves so that they can be self-reliant so that they're not yeah. relying on us i think that's incredibly important so what is it about dmt in particular you know because i'm sure you've had we haven't talked about it but i'm sure you've had experience with a lot of plant medicines there's another little axe another bridge that's built the DMT creates. It's a little bit different than everything else. You know, the other things can get you to some amazing places, but there's something about that particular molecule that allows a certain type of access that's unique. But, you know, we think of that, that molecule as the light switch. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, imagine if you could flick a light switch to the entirety of your consciousness and at the same time talking about that bridge, recognize your own consciousness as the bridge, as the bridge, like a true nexus, a coming together of the entire universe coalesced in your own being and that there's no separation at all. And you can flick a light switch through that and see the entirety of your energetic makeup, that your consciousness could and your mind could fully comprehend your atomic makeup. It could fully comprehend your molecular makeup. It could fully comprehend your cellular makeup. It could fully comprehend every single uh, synapse path through the brain and that you yourself could rewire your brain from all the different problems that you're having, you know, to otherwise. And clearly the, the molecule of DMT is, is purposeful in that. It's purposeful in that, you know, auto produced by the body itself. Yeah. So, so I think that that molecule is, is, it is a, a molecule that's directly related to human consciousness and the turning on of light in human consciousness and so much fear around all this stuff in the world. Like I just don't see the need for there to be so much fear, but I also see the need for there to be a tremendous amount of responsibility in the exploration 
of these chemicals sure. and like how we can use them to to really better ourselves and better humanity. But I just see the, the molecule as uh, a capacity to really not only, you know, re awaken the whole brain to work together. It also then lets you kind of find that place of, of nexus, that center point within you that then allows you to, to see the light of the whole universe and then navigate it, mm -hmm. you know, and to be able to see that your body's made up of that exact same energy and your mind's that your mind's made up of and that your big toes made up of the same stuff as your thoughts, you know, and, and getting that real holistic view on, on what we are, yeah. you know, and, and being able to experience it, not just have it be scientific theory, but really be able to experience our own scientific Well, you theory. end up feeling it a lot of times before you can even verbalize it. Yeah. Like the vocabulary, like, ah, I don't know, but I felt this thing. Yeah. And then as you talk about it and kind of think about it more, but a lot of times our words simply fail because words are tied to ideas that you can, you know, that make sense clearly, you know? Yeah, well, language is a, is a fascinating tool in its own right. If you think about a, a being having language because it's entirely symbolic. Mm -hmm. You know, you're taking something entirely etheric, which is a concept, and now you're going to give a grouping of symbols meaning, and then you're going to combine those symbols into a new symbol that has new meaning made up of those symbols itself. So if you keep digging at it, you keep pulling the thread and take it into eye, anybody who wants to really play with this one, you're never going to get anywhere. Like yeah. you're going to keep pulling and you're going to get another symbol and another symbol and another symbol. And, um, you know, and so it, I look at that as, as being one really finite expression of how human beings perceive, think and express. And that if we look at, you know, the origin, like the epicenter or the origin of these incredible experiences we have, why not have them come through feeling first or come through a hunch or come through intuition or come through the body or come you through know? or come through or, vision, you know, or I mean, vision. Yeah, these visual. It's almost like information in its raw form. It's it coming and it's splashing against this field that ignites them into all of these colors in this kaleidoscope. But this so raw information hits this force field of existence, of physicality, and it pew, hits our brain and we get these visions and these colors and things. And then we have to tr then retranslate that back into symbols so that our brain so can we process can understand it. it yeah. you know? It's a really remarkable thing. And some puzzles will always remain. These, this information that hits our perception and we get it and we go well i got i got nothing on that one yeah. but i understood this one you know that's yeah, what yeah. made sense no and i loved it we would have people on every group that would come down and for people who've seen the ayahuasca art it's these tremendously in intricate patterns and often very colored and stuff like that and um you have some here in the, yeah. in the studio and um some people would come from it and be like, all I saw were, were colors and patterns. And other people would be like, oh my God, I saw divine architecture. I saw uh, yeah. the fabric of space time. And for me, those, all those colors and patterns, just like you're saying, are information, yeah. right? They actually are information. And if you spend enough time in there, you can learn to read them. Yeah. You, you can learn to speak that language. And that's what the language of Ikaro is. Mm -hmm. You know, the language of Ikaro is, is a system of sacred communication between the plant energies and the human energies through that membrane of these shapes, colors, and patterns that allow a pure communication that doesn't have to then be translated. Mm -hmm. And it's a vibratory language instead of symbolic. Is, does, is it gonna be, would it be valuable to you know, put this all down in a book like The World According to Ayahuasca, which is really actually the, the world according to truth, but, <laughs> but would it be valuable or is it just something that, you know what, let's just let everybody go down there see it feel it for themselves because i often wonder if if that makes sense if that would be helpful or if that wouldn't be helpful well we could contact the author of the for dummies series and <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. send them send them through a hundred days of ceremony <laughs> and see. i don't know you know you know it, it, in all fairness to it um there's a certain amount of theory that i think is valuable and mm -hmm. I think it's very limited. Yeah. And I think beyond that, it really does require the personal experience. I think that there's room to be able to translate the experiences and transliterate them into a, an expression of knowledge um, that could be very beneficial to people outside of the use of the plants themselves. So if we took it one step further, very similar to what you guys are doing here, you know, in terms of concept. Yeah. Right. Like the combination of these pieces allows a human being to now experience something so much greater for themselves in their own life. Right. Yeah. 
So if we could take the knowledge, utilize the knowledge in a new way, in a new form of packaging or a new, a new presentation for people, I think that has a tremendous amount of merit. And that's something that I'm already working on. Great. But um, the, the idea of just, you know, you can talk about it forever and try to understand it forever, but we really are babies in that world and we need to take our first steps. So what are the first steps before, you know, besides heading down and, you know, booking a trip to Peru and, and having this? Like what, are, what in your mind are the modalities that you recommend for people to start taking these baby steps? Like if they're going to go down or, or well, just in general just in to general. access, access greater consciousness, to access greater consciousness. Um, that's a really, really good question. I think if I had to like simplify it the most, it would be turn to the universe, mm -hmm. turn to the whole universe at once. Just turn to it. Like you've been turned to inside your brain and inside your feelings and inside your thoughts and inside your theories and inside what's going on on your phone and turn to the whole universe at once and then just say, I'm here. Yeah. I'm ready. Just, I'm ready. Let's okay. We've done it. We've done enough of, you know, micro, mm -hmm. micro, micro, cut off, cut off, cut off. Just come to that moment in your life where you turn to the universe and say, you know, I'm ready. And now let's be gentle because this is the whole universe, yeah. right? This is my whole life we're talking about. We're not mm -hmm. talking about just an aspect of it or anything. Let's start there. Let's start with that, that <coughs> rebirth moment where, you know, when, when you came out of the womb onto earth, <coughs> it was a brand new world. You know, and we've explored that world and explored it and explored it and explored it and explored it. And we've come to a point where we've amassed an understanding of significant limitation. Right. And it's like that's pushing us. It's fueling us. It's a propellant to go beyond those limitations and find answers and be creative. And so so we know empirically that the universe is all there is. You know, so let's turn to that all there is once and say, OK, I'm ready now let's go. It's, it's, it's real. Yeah. Now it's time for it to be real. And I think we can drop, you know, in huge numbers of people very, very quickly, a lot of the childish sort of BS running around through the entire spiritual worlds and psychedelic worlds and everything else, just mm -hmm. with that one move. Cause it's very real. Cause you know it, you're like, uh Oh, mm -hmm. I just did something I can't change from that point. I think the very first lesson we have to learn is patience. Everything comes to everybody in its own due time, especially once you're open. We need patience because people are like, no, I want it right now. And it's like, you're not ready right now. Mm -hmm. This game plays at a level of, of intricacy and synchronicity that would blow people's minds. People are like thinking like, oh, that was synchronistic. It's like, no, every nanosecond is synchronistic, right? There is not one movement on the planet happening right now that's not connected to your movement. So move your hand in front of your eyes and look at that movement and understand that every car driving on the planet right now is moving at exactly the same time. Understand that every human being hangs 10 on the now. People are like searching for the now. Dude, we live the now. No one has ever lived in the past or the future. It is a one time already, expression of consciousness. There. We are yeah. already right there. We're not thinking it. We're not knowing it. We're not connected to it. It's not in our consciousness. We've We've, you know, put up a, a what yeah. I think of as an aberration of, of light in our vision to not see how the fact that we're already right there. All and of the consciousness, all of the healing, all of the love, all of the happiness, all of the fulfillment. We have it already. It's already, including one already. single ancestry, including, you know, one human history, including every movement that every human being has ever made. Like, I like mm -hmm. to think of these things like <laughs> I think of like spreadsheets and I think of like Excel files and I think of every category of human expression and I see that there is a ticker ongoing of every footstep that a human being has ever stepped on the planet and it's just increasing and every breath everybody's ever taken and every thought collectively we've ever had and that's part of the magic of it that is know? the magic we have these special tongues to drink this special coffee in this special delicious shake that I'm drinking absolutely now. I mean, that no other planet no other time could ever experience exactly quite that there's not going to be an environment to produce that and that's that's why there's existence why, i mean why is there all this it's for all these experiences it's for all of these for the whole gamut of all of yeah. it. yeah and i think life's a miracle it's like we don't really know how we got here i mean mm -hmm. these are these are things that i really look for i think like 
let's start with what we really know and what we really don't know. One of the things we really don't know is how we really got here. Another thing we really don't know is how long we'll be here. And another thing we really don't know is how the universe was created. And another thing we really don't know is how long the universe will exist. Let's just start there. That book ended yeah. the entirety <laughs> of our experience. Now we have a container to hold it all. Let's explore, right? Yeah. Let's get fired up on the exploration and see what we can do. Because I think we've tapped less than 1% of human potential. I think everything that is this magnificent existence we have right now is less than 1% of what we can do. And the next evolution is going to be in consciousness. And we're going to see that we're a bridge, literally a living bridge of dimension mm. and that we can extend. And so many of us already know this, that we can tap all of these different dimensions that have all of these different technologies and understandings in them and these incredible capacities to explain and understand and build and grow. And we can really answer a lot of the problems that humanity is facing on the planet right now. Right now, I think I think you're absolutely right. But I also think we shouldn't discredit the stage that we're in because the stage that we're in is also a unique and beautiful stage. Sure. We reach these states of higher consciousness. Some parts of the spectrum are going to go away. These these things that we, we get to do now will become too much like that controlled folly that the Toltecs talk about. It'll just become a little too silly to really fully engage in them and enjoy them the way that we do. I mean, right now we have a full emotional spectrum, yeah. you know, of these, of everything from deep sorrow to deep bliss to, and I know that consciousness will bring, yield amazing gifts and general ease of suffering and be a, a probably overall a more enjoyable state, but let's enjoy this one too because it's wild and fucking crazy and we get to do stuff that at this higher level of consciousness it won't exactly ever be like this again. You Definitely know? won't be like this again. But I think that, you know, I've started to, to reverse the, my direction of understanding and that I thought of higher consciousness as up and out and expansion in that direction. And I really see it as an expansion inward. And I don't see any reason why we can't keep all that stuff. I think we can literally have both. We can have all the fun, all the joy, all the sorrow, all the experience and a container that holds it in a way that we don't have to get super freaky about it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to translate to like, like, you know, putting holes through people and spilling blood over the fact that like we feel really bad that day. <laughs> right, like, right, right. Like, so I think that, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I don't really ascribe to the, the system of thought that, that we lose our humanity by, by, reaching higher states of consciousness. I think that we become much more human reaching higher states of consciousness because human already is this, this incredible love within us that is a medicine for everything, a tremendous amount of knowledge and wisdom and the physicality. Mm -hmm. And so I only see that in the merging of all of those pieces into a cohesive expression of what we already have is what allows the, the opening of the, the doorways. And that's something that I always loved about ayahuasca work is that there's no room for sanctimosity in it because when you're face deep in a puke bucket and that puke bucket bottom goes for eternity <laughs> and you see that you're puking straight through hundreds of dimensions uh -huh. and they're all rainbow light it gives you a whole new perspective but you're you still you're still in the bucket though yeah. right like you know that your jaws have unhinged and the, the great universe is pouring out of you right into that bucket but you're still vomiting right yeah so it's it's it, I mean, do you, but do you think like I'm, I'm with you 100 percent and I'm plowing full steam ahead, no regrets, nothing, yeah. nothing in my rear view. But do you think like 50 shades of gray exists in higher consciousness, like does kinky sex exist in a higher consciousness? I mean, I think we'll probably do away with some of these things that are kind of interesting now that are just going to be like. I can't, you know, spanking you is not going to really, <laughs> it's not going to really feel think, good anymore, Hamilton. We're going to lose a little something. I think we might lose a little something along the way. That's fair. And, you yeah. know, I think that, uh, why not? Why yeah, not? It's and, okay. I mean, but, oh, but, man, it's why a not enjoy huge it win. Now? But I mean, don't, don't we really think though that where we are now in constantly like, drop all the high and mighty wherever, where we are right now are like micro steps learning to deal with the human psyche. Yeah. Right. It's like micro steps. I think we can enjoy all of those micro steps at sure. the same time. You know, I think that there's uh, some some situations happening collectively that doesn't allow people to enjoy some of those micro steps and massive, we can support massive, it. Yeah, massive. We, we need to we can happen. support that. Right. Mm -hmm. We can definitely support that. So individually, definitely, you know, I don't see any reason why pleasure can't be part of the whole experience. It, you know? ha it has to be. It has to be. And it will be. It has for to sure. be. But, you know, also in the greater collectives, you know, maybe it would be okay for everybody to get to eat. 
<laughs> right? Like, just put it out there. Like, maybe it would be okay. Like, is it possible that it would be okay that, and not not to take away the experiences of hunger, right? Like, that has purpose too and everything. And Buddha walking through fields of lepers have purpose and everything like that. And it all has purpose just the way that it is. And you can say that it's all uniquely perfect in every single moment. And it's also uniquely changing in every moment. And, you know, I think that we need to get away, though, from that mindset that we get to pre-create what it's going to look like yeah right yeah. you don't get to pre-create what it's going to get to look like you're always standing on the precipice of the unknown and it's the openness and the receptivity and the the love that we can bring to it or the higher state of consciousness we can bring to it that starts to give it a direction one of the things that <clears throat> the only thing that gives me a little bit of pause is we've been living largely unconsciously for so long and procreating largely unconsciously for so long that our population growth has been really unconsciously played out on a global level. Is there is there any you know concern in your mind that we might have you know we might be a little bit too far behind the eight ball and that these forces are just going to keep playing out and there's going to be just too many people for the resources, too much mass unconsciousness to make the shift that there's just the sheer abundance of humans that are out there are going to be too hard to to you know, to change and, and reach that higher state? I would have said yes years ago. Mm -hmm. Now I wouldn't. There's one aspect to this whole game that we never really give a lot of voice to, which is human ingenuity. And um, I would like to see an evolution of the way we operate collectively. And I think if we become more philanthropic in our nature and to realize that the real efficiency of that philanthropy, really looking out for each other, really does create a capacity to, to have a, a more efficient model that the use of our resource and the use of technology and everything could sustain a much larger population than we think of. Um, the other thing I always think too, especially if we look at history, is don't count Earth out. We need to make friends with Earth real fast. Oh yeah. Real fast, because Earth a resets common, that's the a common, clock that's a common everywhere, theme. right? Common Earth theme resets the clock. Yeah. And so let's make friends with Earth. Right. And, and I think the very first step to do that is to recognize that there is literally no separation between your physical body and Earth. You're made of Earth. You die as Earth and you're connected to it the whole time, even when you're flying in an airplane. And I like to think of outer space because when you're inside space and on Earth, it's a little harder to like get the full perspective because the, the vision becomes really fragmented. But when you're like if you think of like an astronaut looking at space and then you think of the amount of actual space in total outer space that's you know habitable for inhabitable for people it's this tiny little like orange peel it's like tiny right it's really 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 tiny and you know we need to make friends with that we need to make really good friends with that that's a it's a really important point that you made and you know, everybody knows the law that matter cannot be created or destroyed from nothing. Well, so far for now, yeah. you know, maybe there's some other rules there. But in general, as far as the physical laws, that's the truth. And then, but people think about growing. Okay, we grow bigger. We had, add more cells to our body, add more matter. Well, where does that come from? Well, that comes from us eating stuff. Right. Okay. And then where does the stuff that we eat, where does that come from? Well, that comes from generally, it all goes back to plants. At some point, something we're eating eat, ate some plants you know, on down the food chain. Yeah. All right, now where, the, where are the plants getting their cells from? Oh, the plants are getting their cells from the soil and the water that's coming from. Oh, yeah. so really at the bottom, we are actually literally made of earth. We literally, are literally. walking earth. You're walking earth, absolutely. You know, and, and we think of, oh, there's people and then there's earth and no. then there's animals and then there's blah, blah, blah. No, we're all fucking earth. We need, we need to start thinking collectively at, at like the most primal level we're earth yeah, right. and we're big enough now at seven eight billion whatever the population is and i don't know how we even keep track because babies are coming everywhere right so <laughs> so like i see babies everywhere so it's like there's just a whole lot more of us cruising oh, yeah. right on the flight here there were babies like there's babies yeah. everywhere so like that is enough of one collective like one huge collective of a species to to need to understand that we're earth yeah you know not separate from earth anymore and but that's where I go to like the, the evolution of human ingenuity and consciousness because we don't know what it could really look like. We only know what this evolution of consciousness over the last, you know, 
five, six, seven thousand years looks like. It's sort of birth of, of the beginning stages of a greater collective in modern civilization and then, you know, the expansion and expression of that globally. You know, we come to understand that we're Earth. We come to understand that we have a balanced relationship with Earth. We start to revere Earth and we start to revere our bodies as part of Earth. And we start to, to really, you know, come into balance with um, a more collective global expression. I think that can balance itself. I don't see any reason why it can't balance itself. You know, I one agree. thing that, that is clear, <clears throat> really, really clear to me, like really clear, is that human behavior is programmed mm. from baby. Babies have no idea what they're doing in terms yeah. of like how to be an adult human being. And so we have tremendous latitude to be able to change the shape of, and nature of how we, yeah, we work. The, the and Toltecs then, call that the mitote, the dream of the world that shapes us into what we believe is right or wrong. Yeah, and then we do. think we're that thing, yeah. right? Because we've been thinged. We've had enough thing thrown at us that we have become thinged instead of this, you know, you know sort of mercurial expression of a being on Earth. That real identification with human being as your consciousness expands gets diluted in certain ways and you start to really feel like you're part of the earth and you start to really feel like you're part of the universe and you start to really feel like your body is a system that is in balance and harmony with the different rhythms and that you know if if we had that merging of sort of modern knowledge and ancient knowledge and understanding and balance together i think you could see tremendous growth economically i think you could see tremendous growth uh in terms of social stability I think we could see a tremendous reduction in crime and, you know, a greater allocation of resources. It's hard to do crime when you're realizing you're perpetrating crime on yourself. It's a lot harder. <laughs> and it's a lot harder. Yeah, it's a lot less, lots less fun to steal from another version of you. Yeah, and, and I've lived in places where there's a tremendous amount of crime in the form of theft and stuff like that. And it really is comparative competition, poverty driven. Yeah. Scarcity thing. Scarcity. It's scarcity, and, and I'm going to get me mine, and it's scarcity, and then more scarcity and more scarcity. I think, you know, again, there's a lot more efficiency, a lot more efficiency. And if we look at resource use, if it's all about efficiency. Yeah. Right? You know that here with on it. It's all about efficiency. And so if we can reduce the amount of loss and we can reduce the amount of redundancy and we can reduce the amount of friction – you're going to gain a tremendous amount of growth. We don't know ultimately what the potential of that would be, but that's what the, like if, if I channel the earth, that's what the earth tells me. Like I spend a lot of time like hanging with earth. Yeah. Likewise. You know, and the earth, earth, the earth always tells me the earth consistently in a variety of different medicines and says the same thing. It said, Aubrey, focus on consciousness. I'll take care of the rest. Correct. So that's how I see it too. And I, I think that, you know, with the work that I'm doing around consciousness now and the expansion that we're going to make this year and the Blue Morpho Foundation, we're going to be able to start to actually scientifically and empirically prove these things that we're talking about. Beautiful. I can't yeah. wait. Well, you ready for some more people to show up at Blue Morpho? It'd be great. Because it's going to happen. I'm, I'm, we're right, always we'll tell ready. People, tell people where to go. Tell people how to find you. Uh, and we'll, well wrap this thing up. BlueMorphoTours.com for Peru and BlueMorphoFoundation.org for our charity work here in the States. And uh, to participate, you just need to be open and, and ready to have some really incredible evolution because that's what we're all about, just evolving human consciousness and really taking it to that next level for your own well-being and then a collective well-being. Indeed. Well, Hamilton, I'm going to call this part one because I know that we're going to do this again cool. at some point. So Great. I appreciate having you out here and I'm um, looking forward to spending a couple of days here in Austin. And, yeah, and well, thank you so here. much for letting me be here and, you know, pleasure to meet you guys and, you know. Kudos to all the work you're doing. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Much love, everyone. We will talk to you soon. Peace. Peace.